Welcome to the Catholic Community Scripture Study held at St. John the Evangelist Catholic Church in Jackson, Michigan. I will be your host, Todd Gale, as we walk our way through the book of Genesis, a line-by-line study of the first book of the Sacred Scriptures. the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we begin the first book for for our Jewish friends, the first book for Christians, and even for Muslims in our sacred scripture, Genesis. That word means, in Greek, it means origins or beginning, like the word generate or generations. It's, it's, it comes from that. The Jews call this book Bereshit, which means in the beginning. It's one word in the beginning. And Genesis is part of the Pentateuch, the five books. That's what penta, five, took, means the scrolls or the containers. The five containers of the story of Moses. The story of Moses in five parts. Our friends, the Jews also call this the Torah, which means the law and and the teachings. And the whole Jewish Bible, what what we Christians would call the Old Testament, is sometimes called the Tanakh, from T-N-K. T is Torah, the law, N is Nevi'im, the prophets, and K is the Ketuvim, which is the sacred writings, the the other books of the Old Testament. So together, T-N-K, the Tanakh. Now, there's many theories as to who wrote the Pentateuch, and especially this book of of Genesis. Most traditions will say Moses. Some traditions say Joshua, after the time of Moses. Some scholars think it was put together by someone in David's court, you know, in around 1000 BC. And the most popular theory in the last 200 years or so is called the Documentary Hypothesis. There were several groups of authors and editors over the century. Now, we'll dig into all that in great detail in the sessions ahead, but if we do all of that in the introduction, we'll never get into the text. So for our purposes, Jesus said Moses wrote these books. Paul talks about the books of Moses. The early church fathers all called this the writing of Moses. So if that's good enough for Jesus and Paul and the early fathers, that's good enough for us, it should be. So at least it hints towards Moses as the initial author. And and I'd be very comfortable with saying that. So for, for the most part in our study, we're going to talk about Moses in general as being the author. Now, we're going to be using the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. And at this time, the uh, the Old Testament is not published under one cover, uh, like the New Testament is under one cover with the, um, the uh, Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. So each of the books of the Old Testament, I think you can get almost all of them now, they're published separately with notes by Dr. Scott Hahn and by Curtis Mitch and their amazing team. And I'll, I will be referring to that often. Now, the first 11 chapters of Genesis are very different kinds of writings than 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 the other books in the Bible. The genre is very different. Um, many Catholic Bibles have a heading that says the primeval history. Primeval meaning the very first age. Some Bibles call this the creation story, or there might be a title, the creation narrative. When, when we read this, are, is this a scientific, literal account of what actually happened? Probably not. And that's really important to get. But for this creation story, we might not say it's literal or exact, but it's poetically, symbolically true. It's, it's true, but it's very colorful. It's using poetry and sweeping images. Now, for example, here's some true statements that are not literal. Our priest has tons of emails to respond to. After fasting, she was so hungry, she could eat a horse. She has a heart of gold. She was so mad, she was spitting nails. 
I love the Bible so much I could just eat it up. I could do this forever. Right now, obviously not all those things are literal, but they can all be true. So the obvious question comes up when we're reading a story like, like in Genesis, we're reading a book of the Bible, how do we know whether we're supposed to be reading it as if it's a poem, as if it's a parable or a story, or if it's an historically accurate event? Well, the short answer is you read the commentary and the notes and the explanations from the scholars who study this stuff, and they'll tell you what genre this is. But there are also lots of clues in the writing itself, like some of the examples I just gave. And there's a different tone. There's a feeling. There's a huge sweeping narrative. There's usually no solid link to historical names or geography or events if, if this is one of these poetic kinds of stories. Um, it seems kind of otherworldly. If it's literal, if you take it literally, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Like there's no sun until day four, yet somehow there's day and night and somehow the plants are thriving before day four. In the original Hebrew, too, if you, if you were to really dig into this, it's obviously poetry. There's rhyming and acrostics and repetition and themes that were just part of their culture, right? And another obvious thing, there's no eyewitness during this event because it's about the creation of humans before humans were created. So the only way we would know about this is if someone told us who, if God told us. Right. So it's going to be a sweeping kind of poetic narrative. Now, I'm only talking about the first 11 chapters of Genesis. After that, we're going to get into something that's a lot more historical and provable in archaeology and in history. And it's written in a style that's, that's a little more factual. In our study Bible notes, around page 14, there's a really great couple of paragraphs that really talk about this. We believe these things really happened, but not necessarily in a scientific or literal way. One archbishop in the 1940s says it uses a popular description of creation from the ancient point of view using figurative language. The notes say it seems best to say that Genesis 1 to 11 occupies a unique place somewhere between history and myth. Father John Ricardo, in his wonderful book, Rescued and, and in the Rescue Project, he calls this biblical myth. And that's not the same as Greek myth or Roman mythology. He says biblical myth does not mean untrue, but it's something so big and vast. It has to be communicated with a poetic compression. I love that term, a poetic compression. Now we could easily go on and on and on about this. We will unpack this more a little bit. Let's read Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. So this whole creation account in Genesis 1 is a poem. And anywhere in the Bible, when Hebrew poetry shows up, like think of it as a section that's bold and italics and underlined, right? It's really, really important. And we'll point out several of those sections of Hebrew poetry as we come upon them. In the beginning, before time was created, God was already in existence. All throughout chapter 1 of Genesis, the word for God in Hebrew is Elohim. Elohim, the M at the word at the end, the I M at the end, makes this a plural form of El or Elohu. El, which is sort of just a generic word for a God. In, in, in the Near East, in, in, in ancient times. Pagan gods, we could say, were like lowercase g god or lowercase e l. But the one true God of Israel is not only capitalized, the one true God of Israel is linguistically a plural. Elohim, not just El or Elohu. Technically, this can be translated as gods or judges or even as a council of gods. 
still, even though this word is plural, there's no connection to polytheism of the pagans. It's not a it's not about a pantheon of gods. This creation story is very clear that this Elohim is one. There's this mystical play between the plural and the singular. There, there's a singular name and there's and there's pronouns, but all throughout this El, this Elohim, is clearly depicted as one. You know, as Christians, we believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, a trinity who's also a unity, one God in three persons. Now, this was not revealed to ancient Israel. It's hinted at. We look into this and we see some obvious signs as we look back at it. But the idea that Jesus is God the Son who is totally connected and one with the Father and that the Holy Spirit is one connected to both of them, that isn't specifically mentioned until Jesus himself tells us this in the Gospel of John, way into the New Testament. This truth has always been there but it's not been explained until the time of Jesus. It's like Moses, the sacred author, really didn't understand the Trinity, yet somehow the Holy Spirit guided him as he's writing to mystically put these words into what he wrote. God being a word and a spirit and a creator and this plural, yet it's, it's a singular at the same time. So in the beginning, Barashit, bara, created, not just meaning to form or to put together, but the creation of something out of nothing. The Latin term is ex nihilo, which means out of nothingness, right? So this, this whole expression, these first few words, in the beginning, God created, in Hebrew, it's Barashit, Bara Elohim, right? In the beginning, created did God, right? We say in English, in the beginning, God created. Now in the Bible, this bara, this verb of created, is only used with Elohim, with God as the subject. God is the only one that can bara, right? And this God is outside of creation. He's an artist creating something. He's above and beyond the creation. He's separate from the creation. He is not in the creation. He is not part of the creation. That's what pantheism is. The, the religious belief that God is actually part of the world, right? He's actually part of the trees and the sun and the stars. All of those things are God. That's not what we believe as Christians, and, and the Jewish belief is not that either. God is outside of his creation. And what did he create? He created the heavens and the earth. Now, in the ancient Hebrew, there's no single one word for the cosmos, for the universe. Heavens and the earth means he created everything, everything that's possible. And now, in this beginning, there's this formless wasteland. There's, there's formlessness, there's emptiness, and darkness covered the abyss, or, or darkness was upon the face of the deep, right? This is so odd. Why is this so odd? Re read that really closely. There's already something in existence. There's already some kind of dark water some kind of abyss, some sense of chaos, maybe even evil. And Moses gives us no explanation. The Lord God created, but it seems like this chaos was already there, the abyss. And there's a beautiful play on words here in the Hebrew, the tohu wa bohu. That's what formless and empty means. The, 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 there was no form and it was devoid, right? And, it, and it's almost the sing-songy Dr. Seuss kind of thing when you were to, re, if you were to read it in Hebrew, the tohu wa bohu, right? And there's a logical pattern that we're going to follow. 
in, in the next six days of creation, the first three days are going to deal with the tohu, with the formlessness. In the first three days, a form will be created. And in the second three days, it's going to deal with the bohu, the emptiness. And the next three days, that those, those spaces will now be filled. But on this first day, there's light and dark. We tend to think of darkness automatically. We link it with evil, right? With death, with the unknown. Um, darkness in, in, in conjunction with chaos in the abyss, right? This would be opposite of God. Darkness is not just lack of light. Like we tend to think of darkness as opposed to the good. Many scholars believe that this this existence of darkness that, that, that the, the author doesn't explain, Genesis doesn't tell us anything about. A lot of scholars think Genesis doesn't tell us about this because it has more to do with the creation of the angels, the fall of Lucifer, the rebellion against, against God. It's been thought for, for many centuries that, that the biblical author did not describe the great war in heaven with an angel of light named Lucifer that, that rebels against God and sweeps a third of the angels with him. We read about all that in other books of the Bible. Other books tell us that story. And perhaps the chaos of that war is depicted here and symbolized by this darkness and this abyss and this deep that's already there. We don't know. We can only speculate. But very interestingly, in verse 2, the Spirit of God is moving over the waters. Some translations in English say, a mighty wind swept over the waters. That seems very different, but in Hebrew, the word ruach, ruach means wind. It also means spirit, and it also means breath. The one word in Hebrew has three different words in English for us. Wind, spirit, breath are all ruach. The same with Greek. Pneuma is wind, spirit, and breath in Greek. And the same with Latin. Spiritus is wind and spirit and breath in Latin. Right? Well, the ancient Near East had this vision of, of this chaos and this water and this primordial soup and that the mighty wind, the breath of God, the Spirit of God soared over it, swept over it, hovered over it. The rabbis liked the idea of like this incubating image, like a mother hen sort of brooding over her chicks. But most scholars kind of prefer a little more power than that, a superlative, the soaring over of the Spirit of God. The role of the Holy Spirit is always to sweep in and make a new creation, to make order out of chaos. Think of the Holy Spirit in, in the time of Moses with the, the, you know, the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah glory cloud with fire and smoke that hovered over the tabernacle and led the people, right? This is that Holy Spirit. And we see this image repeated all throughout the Bible of the Spirit hovering over waters of new creation. We see it happen with Noah in the flood. The Holy Spirit's not hovering over the water, but a dove flies in, right? The dove flies in. It's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Moses and the people pass through the waters of the Red Sea, and it's a new creation of a new covenant people, and the glory cloud of the Lord is the spirit that leads them. And in the New Testament, most importantly, the baptism of Jesus, where once again, we have the Holy Spirit, like hovering over the water of a new sense of creation, right? It's so beautiful. We could go on and on with that, but we're going to go forward here. In verse three, God said, let there be light. And there was light. Do you see the Trinity in here. Elohim 
takes a breath, a ruach, and he breathes out a word. The word is light. Jesus is the word and Jesus is the light of the world. So here we have the father breathing. And what is he breathing out? He's bringing out a word. We have father, Holy Spirit, and son. The three are one. The three are a trinity, but the three are a unity. And this is so amazing. When God speaks, his words have so much power. Theologians call this performative utterance. When he says something, it is. He's not just commanding himself. He's not saying, hey, I'm God. I'm going to make some light. He's not bragging. I just made some light, right? What he's doing is he's calling light out of the darkness. He's calling order out of the chaos of the abyss. He thinks it. He says it. And it is. Think of when Jesus calls Lazarus out of the grave, right? Back in the, in the New Testament, ahead in the New Testament, when, when he calls his friend Lazarus out, he says it. And it is. Think about when Jesus says, this is my body. He says it. And it is. And priests today are given this performative utterance when they take on the very personhood of Jesus as a priest and they say, this is my body, they say it. And it is the body of Christ. It is his body. Wow. Light, right? God says light, that's Jesus. The first necessary act of creation. It's definite, it's immediate, it's ordered, it's the exact opposite of the chaos, the deep, the darkness, the abyss. You've surely heard of the Big Bang Theory. I'm not talking about a, a TV sitcom. I'm talking about the scientific theory. Monsignor Georges Henry Joseph Edward Lemaitre, right? Lemaitre. Um, his name, by the way, means master, the master in French. He was a French priest. He died in 1966. Actually, he was Belgian, right? A Belgian Jesuit priest, an astronomer, a professor of physics, and a priest. He was the one that developed this theory and really articulated it, but he believed that God banged the Big Bang. If there was a bang, God was the banger. That's the way our good friend Peter Kraft, Dr. Peter Kraft, explains it. The light was made and the light was good and then got separated. All creation is going to be in a state of goodness in its original creation. God declares it so. And God separates, discriminates to make something that is already there better. Right? The, the darkness is there. He introduces the light with his, perform his performative utterance. Right? And then he separates. He's, he's making things better. And I want you to think about this light, not only in the sense of light and darkness separated, which could make us think of good and evil being separated. It could make us think of logic and light and truth entering into the abyss. All of that is very probable and very possible. We'll talk more about that next time. But this could be seen as the creation of time. This has nothing to do with the stars and the sun and, and, and the moon. They're not even created until day four. Perhaps this has mostly to do with the passing of time. And Israelites have always understood that the day begins at sunset. Evening is when the day begins. Why? Because of this revelation right here in Genesis 1. It was evening, then morning, the first day. Even now for the Jews, the day begins at sundown, what we would say is the day before. Almost all other cultures in the world, including our own, start the day at sunrise or at, at midnight, at least. Hebrews are very unique with this. 
So I want to end today talking just for a, a little bit about time. What is time? Classically, philosophy and theology says that time is the measurement of change or action or movement. Time marks improvements and growth, as well as failings and death. Time is not tangible. It can't be proven, can't be disproven, yet all humanity experiences it. For some reason, God created a universe with time where all creatures are interacting on the planet, living together in the present, together. And as far as we know, other than through memory or imagination, we can't literally go backward or go forward in time. We cannot change the time in which our, our physical temporal bodies live. The Christian would say, unless we somehow touch the eternity of God. Because God is able to now and forever touch the now and the forever at the same time. Now, eternity is not just the measurement of time. Eternity can be when perfection is reached. There won't be any improvements. There won't be any change in the way that we think about it. There won't be any need for time. Eternity is completeness and perfection. Sister Mary Michael Fox is a, is a regular with the Franciscan University of Steubenville Conferences. She has a talk for priests that she did several years ago that's, that's on YouTube. Oh my goodness, it is so amazing when she talks about eternity and time. She says eternity, uh, eternity is not just unlimited time. There's no border to the left or to the right. If that's what we think of when we think of time, we're making God too small. If time means change and development, and God is outside of that time, beyond it, he created it, and God does not need time. But our human comprehension needs time. We couldn't handle the fullness of eternity with these bodies and these brains. You know, if everything was perfected all at once, before we are ready to, to receive that truth, like it would probably just explode our heads, right? But we get a taste of that eternity, Sister Mary Michael says, we get a taste of that eternity whenever we enter into the love of God. He offers this with every breath we take. He is calling us slowly slowly outside of time to enter into his perfection and his eternity. For now we are in time. For now we're changing, we're improving. That's how he created this world. Chew on that. Chew on that for just a few moments. Actually, chew on that for like a week until we meet again. Just sit with that. So as I said, we're going to take things kind of slowly. Um, we're going to unpack a lot of things about science and philosophy and theology and lots of different aspects of creation. And we'll do it just sort of bit by bit so that we don't take up all the time um, before we dig into the scripture. As we will clearly see, we are not made just for this world, this world that's being talked about in Genesis 1, we're made for something far greater. This world in Genesis 1 is going to be shown to be temporary. Oh, it gets so excited. Aren't you just so ready? Make sure to read ahead, make sure to pray, and we'll see you next time. All glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. God bless everyone. Thank you for joining me.
Thank you so much for walking with us through this study of the book of Genesis.